I think we're ready. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our conference. This is the 10th conference, the second international. Uh, we're in the Institute of Chronology, Polish Academy of Sciences in Sopot. My name is Tymon Zieliński, and I'm the chairman of the association. And this is Professor Janusz Pemkowiak, director of the institute. So could you please open the conference as a host? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, everybody. As you already know, I am the director of the institute. I am also a chemist by education and marine geochemist by experience. As a director, I have had this privilege and pleasure to open the conference for almost 10 years. And it seems that I am the most traditional fan and certainly the oldest fan of the youth conference. I realize that for some of you, it is the first possibility to publicly present her or his uh, results. And uh, I wish everybody that this uh, opportunity is, has uh, a sweet taste, not a bitter taste. As uh, I believe that young scientists are an important segment of the uh, scientific community, I observe with satisfaction that the conference is growing and gradually turning an international one. And as I, am, uh, as I uh, come to wishes, I would like to indicate that in Poland, the 26th of May is the Mother's Day. So to all those who qualify, to all ladies who qualify, I extend my wishes of all the best in this Mother's Day. Thank you. Thank you very much. OK, before, before we go into the scientific program, uh, I would like to give you some technical information. Uh, we have uh, slots 12 minutes plus 3. Uh, so please stick to your time. You, you probably notice that the agenda is very tight. So uh, the chairpersons, please keep the time, and, and we have to we have to be we have to follow the schedule because otherwise it's going to be a problem. We have the one-minute poster presentation session. So for those who have posters, please present your posters during this session. We had it last year, and it worked out really really good. So. I, I strongly recommend it. It's not, not obligatory, but I strongly recommend it. Um, uh, we'll have coffee breaks. Uh, we have water in, in the corridor, so please use it as, as much as you wish. Um, I guess if there are other questions that you would have, please ask me or any person from, from our uh, association. Uh, okay. I suppose it's 10 past, so we can start with the scientific program. This is the 10th anniversary, so uh, we had previously we had guests, uh, speaking guests from different organizations. Uh, we had uh, Professor Pemkowiak giving the talk. We had Professor Wengzin, who is here. Uh, we had um, uh, the Vice President of the Polish Academy of Sciences, Professor Rowinski here. 10th anniversary, uh, we sort of made the decision that it's time to round up what we've done in 10 years, so it's going to be my show. And I have 20 minutes for that, so please be patient. Okay, I will start. Okay, now come the problems with... Okay, so my title is Where is the World Heading? A Subjective and Selective Review of the Past 10 Years. 10 years, that's probably long enough to, to try to do something. Oh boy. Okay. So from the beginning, 
it all started in fall 2017, uh, 2016. No, it's wrong. It's 2006. It should be 2006. Sorry about that. Uh, uh, Institute of Oceanology, we have a nice ship. We do a lot of cruising. And during the, one of the trips to Tallinn, actually, in the Baltic, uh, a group of, of us were discussing different ideas what to do. And one of the ideas was, why don't we just start some association, foundation, whatever, just to do something more, something aside of our work. Discussions quite often over the beer lasted for about half a year. Uh, it ended up in July 2007 that we registered the Sopot Science Association. We had exactly 15 people uh, which is the uh, requirement to register some organization. And from the beginning, we had the headquarters in, in this institute, and I have to, I have to thank Professor Pemkowiak once again, and Professor Pazdro, the director, vice director of the institute. We have fantastic cooperation. And, and I'm really, really happy to say that this is, this is something worth talking about, because uh, we have a lot of freedom and a lot of support. Uh, the first chairman was one of the founders, uh, Marcin Wesławski, Professor Wesławski from our institute. We started our activities in fall 2007, quite, quite early after the registration. And then the most of our activities were in the former place in Sopot Bukarnia, which was uh, a nice place with great coffee very nice books, very nice personnel, so we, we had a lot of interesting meetings there. Between 2008 and 17, we had over, I, I, that's why I said over 130 popular lectures because I lost count at some point. Uh, uh, popular lectures, meetings, and all sorts of events. Some of them are uh, up to time, like for example the one with gender. Some of them were very accidental. We just learned that one of our colleagues, uh, 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 Ilona Wisniewska, launched a book, and this is the one, uh, White Christmas. Uh, uh, another one was the University of Gdańsk. We had a Balkan Fest, very nice, very nice event, two days with good food lots of dancing. We, we are di deci di discussing the end of the world issues. We were discussing issues of women and all sorts of other interesting meetings. These are just certain examples of what we've done. I have to say that we attract, usually we attract pretty healthy crowd, but quite often uh, we have very small crowds. These are examples of nice crowds. Uh, I have to say that after 10 years we have no statistics. Zero. Sometimes we have, in our opinion, very interesting subject and 10 people come. Then we have interesting subject, 50 people come. Then we have subject that we have no idea if it's going to work out or not. And we have 200 people. And really, believe it or not, we have no good statistics. Our crowds are quite diverse, as you can see. Uh, this this one is from uh, sorry from the gender studies. This is also gender. This was, I suppose, apocalypse. So as you can see, we we don't strive to be incredibly serious. It's a support science association, but we we sort of try to not to be over serious about about the issues. So we come to the conference, as I mentioned in here, the jewel in our crown. It's the 10th edition, the first edition 2008. We had eight submissions, definitely <laughs> dominated by us, yeah? seven, seven people from, from our crowd. 2009, well, one could argue that it's a fantastic increase because it's over 100%. Still, seven of our members, and from the moment we, we launched the international edition with English language last year, as you can see, we have 60 submissions last year, 
only from four from our members, and 66 submissions, five from our members. The basic idea for this conference from the very beginning was that it's for you, that means young scientists. Uh, the second idea was that it's in interdisciplinary. All disciplines are represented here. As you can see in the posters, as you can see in the agenda, uh, the idea was that we collect the entire crowd. We don't want to be in the specific field only. And the third idea was uh, the title from the very beginning, where the world is heading. We had lots of discussions about it. Where is the world heading or where the world is heading is the better one. We still don't know, but we stick to the very original idea where the world is heading. Uh, we managed to, to publish, based on, on this conference, we managed to publish two Springer books, Impact of Climate Changes on Marine Environments and Insights of, on environment, Environmental Changes. This year we have an option for the third book, so you probably got, all, all of you got the information, so please, please take it into consideration. Okay, so organizational information are sort of boring, but I, I, I guess we had to go through that. So where is the world heading? No question here, the where is the world heading? And this is my own scientific perspective, very, very subjective own perspective. We started in 2007. So one of the, one of the uh, issues that are uh, discussed in this institute at every level, we have uh, different strategic, um, uh, strategic directions of, of science, and one of them is the climate change. So luckily for us, in 2007 was one of the, it was the third or the fourth report of the IPCC, panel and 2013 was the second one so it's every six years so so from the scientific perspective you can see that over these 10 years of our work in the institute in the in the society we we get you probably cannot see very well but we get information this is the the last the last column this level of scientific understanding and these are different components of, of the atmosphere like like uh, carbon dioxide, uh, aerosols, and so forth. So over the, the, the period of six years, between 2007 and 2013, in science, there is a very nice progress in climate change understanding. Uh, in these last columns, if you see, for example, medium low or low level of scientific understanding, so after six years in 2013, this level is either medium, so like one level up, or, or even high. So from the 10 year perspective, we can say that in, in this type of, of research, we have really very nice progress and it's continuing. A very interesting uh, idea, which is half political, half scientific, or rather I would say it's, it's like for all of us, as you can see in the next slide, is the 17 goals to transform our world. In 2015, countries adopted the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Over the past 15, 20 years, the, the, the idea of, of sustainable development uh, has been discussed over and over. Many definitions were created and many, many approaches were, were adopted by different scientists, by different countries by different organizations. Uh, this 2015 meeting sort of rounded up to the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. And another important thing that, that happened in the climate change studies in 2016 is the Paris, uh, Paris Agreement. So if, you, if we look into these 17 sustainable development goals, as the UN Secretary General stated, it's the, our shared vision of humanity and a social contract between the world's leaders and the people. They are to-do list for people and planet and a blueprint for success. If you look, look at these, it's no poverty and the 17 is, oh boy, you cannot see. Um, 
partners for the, for the goals. Uh, what is interesting for us in the institute here is the climate action and the, the number 14 is the marine environment. So at least in this institute, two out of 17 are directly for us. All 17 of them, just like we're sitting here, are exactly for all of us. There's education, there's gender, there is uh, no poverty, no hunger, pretty much like what we are sitting here. When, if we look in the agenda, all of us can fit into this, this schedule. So I would sort of say that the, the, the idea of the conference in 2008 with the title where the world is heading sort of fits very well into that. It seems like the world is heading into the right direction. It's adopted by the, by the governments of many, many countries. So if we, if we think in terms of realizing it by 2030, I think it's a very positive vision. So what do we have next? Another interesting initiative appeared in 2016, the 1020 initiative. Please remember, it's my own perspective. I'm an oceanographer in this institute. Uh, since over 70% of the, of the globe are oceans, and we really don't know that much about them, we know that's what people say. We know more about the, the outer space than about our oceans. Uh, there is a dramatic need to, to do something about it. The, the oceans are degraded. With 70% of the planet's surface, this is really alarming. So one of the initiatives, the 1020 initiative, is that we have the completely, completely protected ocean areas in 10% by 2020. What is innovative about it is that the 10% the of the ocean is uh, in this approach what we mean is not only the surface of the ocean, but it's the entire water column, including the, the sea bottom. So it's 10% of something like that. Uh, 137 countries, shown in green, have declared some form of marine protected area. As you can see, Poland is in here. And what is important for further talks, USA is also here. Majority, majority of countries, I, I, I'm not sure it's like 200 countries in the world, 200 something, many of them, or may, maybe not many of them, but some of them have no access to the sea, so they're excluded sort of from, from the very beginning. But uh, it seems like it's a very ambitious and good idea, and I know that uh, uh, the marine protected areas that have been created s several years ago, they already they already give a lot of good information and, and, and they work in, in terms of marine biodiversity and pollution. Uh, another big milestone in oceanography and marine studies is that the first global uh, integrated marine assessment uh, has been launched in 2017. Uh, this is the very first of, of the series. and, and Apparently, it maps all the information about the ocean. What is, what is very important for us and very nice, uh, our first chairman, uh, Martin Wenswaski, is one of the co-authors of this, of this work. The works on, on, on the second edition, which will be launched probably in 2020, we are also involved in it, and, and it's under the United Nations. Uh, protection, not, maybe not protection, but it's supported by the United Nations. So this is a very big, big step. It, this is the, like the first compendium of, of knowledge about the ocean on this level. It was several years of work of hundreds of scientists. Some other current developments. Another, another report by IPCC has started. And again, I'm happy to say that People from, from our institute and from our association are involved in the works for the uh, next report. Just like I said, works on the second assessment of the oceans is underway. There will be a very big conference in, in New York in June this year. Also, 
on the very political level with General Assembly and, and General Secretary of the UN involved. So a lot is going on. If you, if you look at it, a lot, of, a lot of things are going on in the very right direction. Uh, we have, in 2017, a natural marine world heritage in the Arctic Ocean. The report, it's a big hundreds of pages of, of information about the Arctic. Arctic is a very important issue in the climate discussions. Uh, we will launch another book by Springer, and one of my fairly, uh, one of my very favorite things, it's in a couple of years, the Harvard doctors and genetis, genetists uh, want to uh, resurrect a mammoth. So we'll have like the beginning of Ju Jurassic Park, I believe. So. You, if you look at it, uh, the, the science, in, in very particular direction, climate change, the mammoth doesn't work in here, but it's interesting for me. Uh, there's a lot of going on, and we get very many good information, and we're getting closer and closer to some answers. However, so is it really going into the right direction? And this is the, the last part of my presentation. Uh, the Paris Agreement, it was signed in, on 12 December 2015. The statements that I took out from it is, the climate change is now affecting every country on every continent, and other information. The greenhouse gas emissions from human activities are deriving climate change and continue to rise. This is something that has been adopted by uh, pretty much all the countries of the world. The politicians signed it. In, in case of Poland and USA, uh, they signed it on the 22nd of April 2016. We ratified it on 7 October 2016. USA accepted it on the 3rd September 2016. So again, we, we, we get a fantastic example of, yes, we realize how important climate change is and how how much we have to do in order to, to change things for better. And here comes the politics. I'm sorry, but, but I have to give you some examples. Our Ministry of, of, of Education in 2015, she stated that the truth is that there is no global warming. It's the same year that we ratified, uh, we, we signed the, the, uh, the, the agreement, the Paris Agreement. Why do they say the opposite? And it's very interesting to, to see the, the expression, they. Because it is huge cash which ecologists make on this warming thing. So it's completely contradictory to what has been signed. Again, in, on December 22nd, 2016, it's a myth. There's no global warming, it's a myth. And therefore, in, uh, starting September 1st, 2017, in Polish schools, it's, it's not going to be in the curriculum. It's going to be ignored, since it's a myth. Uh, the President of the United States of America, a very expressive person, he thinks that's a bullshit. Our planet is actually freezing. It was on January 1st, 2014. Well, one could expect that perhaps things change. No, on the 23rd of April 2017, it's a, an, an important statement by, by the President of USA. He fails to mention climate change in Earth Day. It's never been like that. It's the first time in, I don't know, long history of, of this type of statements that, that has been uh, ignored. Well, the scientific uh, information is just the opposite. Yeah? The Arctic sea ice is getting thinner, faster. That's from Scientific American. Sea I Arctic sea ice wintertime extend. It's another record low. Uh, warming twice as fast uh, as the rest of the planet. The Arctic is ground zero for climate change. It's from the report 2017. So obviously, uh, what has been stated by by the president and the minister has nothing to do with, with the real life observations and real science. Uh, I don't know how many of you are aware of that, but on 22nd April 2017,
there was a march for science, and actually, I must have, I, I must uh, admit that I learned about it after the 22nd of April. But the scale of this of this march, and it already turned into some sort of a movement. Uh, it was in more than 600 cities around the world. So, and and this is the, like the, the the message of of the march. We march as an unprecedented coalition of organizations and individuals. We march because science is critical to our health, economies, food security, and safety. So, so it exactly works together with the 17 sustainable goals. Yes, We march to defend the role of science in policy and society. Uh, has anyone heard of that here? OK, so good for you. Sorry. I. I missed that. Well, and the conclusion. So what can we do? We have no other choice. We'll have to march for science or, or my last slide is we're back to, to early type of science, like in this Gary Larson cartoon, the early experiments in transportation. We don't really want to invent transportation again. So. Uh, let's hope that, that science will defend its principles. And this is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Point we're starting first scientific session, uh, the polar studies, so the chairpersons are ready. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I would like uh, to welcome you all uh, at our uh, first session at the International Support Youth Conference. Um, uh, I would like to remind speakers that uh, they have 12 minutes for the presentation and uh, three minutes for the question uh, at the end. Uh, our first speaker is Marta Konik, so welcome. Good morning, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Marta Konik. Uh, I'm a PhD student here at the Institute of Oceanology, uh, Polish Academy of Sciences. My PhD supervisor is Associated Professor Miros Mondarecki. And today I would like to say a few words about near surface variability of the water properties uh, in relation to the ocean color remote sensing in the European Arctic. Uh, this is uh, an interesting uh, region, very important because uh, it's the dynamic uh, area of mixing of different water masses. The cold uh, Sorkop current, uh, the warm uh, West Spitsbergen current taking Atlantic waters up north, um, and uh, East Greenland current taking wa uh, cold waters south. Uh, this mixing <coughs> makes it a very uh, dynamic place. Uh, highly productive and uh, to calculate uh, this and estimate uh, the uh, production and biomass uh, I use satellites to get uh, information from the vast areas uh, however I would like to focus today on the on the assessment of the uh, derivation of surface chlorophyll concentrations which are a common proxy for this biomass calculations uh, and of course the uh, influence of the vertical um, profiles uh, the vertical um, variability uh, which occurs because of the um, different densities of these water masses and uh, res that results uh, in the uh, chlorophyll maximum occurring deeper uh, in the near surface not only at the surface part. Uh, to, as to do the assessments, uh, I would like to analyze sampling uh, data, uh, field data, uh, collected mostly uh, in the Arctic experiment uh, from the Oceania uh, during three years, 2013 to 2015, collected uh, in the Sedum Heat project. 
we obtain uh, more than 150 uh, samples from uh, for all parameters. Uh, we measure the spectrophotometrically, for example, absorption. Um, and uh, of course, in the uh, water column, we use uh, as well spectral absorption and attenuation sensor and optical profiling systems to get uh, continuous information in the profile. I will describe the water optical properties using inherent optical properties that are independent uh, on the, uh, of the light field uh, and that is uh, above the water, the light conditions, uh, the backscatter coefficient, and then the absorption. Uh, the absorption uh, that uh, contributes to it, uh, absorption by water molecules, phytoplankton particles, yellow substances, and non-algal particles. Then there are the apparent optical properties that are dependent on the light conditions, uh, and especially the uh, remote sensing reflectance, uh, which we may obtain from the satellite sensors. Uh, this is the ratio of the water leaving radiance that gives information about the um, water composition uh, and uh, in relation uh, to the irradiance on the surface. There are related uh, using analysis uh, in the certain parts of the spectrum. Uh, for the global uh, global purposes, they are based on the phytoplankton um, absorption spectra. They are uh, compared blue uh, signal in the blue part of the spectrum of the reflectances to the green, where the absorption is relatively low. We have a throw here. And then the mathematical uh, relations are computed. Uh, for the whole uh, data set, there is a strong correlation between the absorption, uh, summary absorption uh, by yellow substances and all the particles. Here I present uh, the uh, measured at the wavelength 676 nanometers. And there is a strong correlation with the chlorophyll A concentration. And uh, there is also a strong, really, uh, a strong absorption by particles uh, with the uh, absorption by the phytoplankton particles par in particular. Um, so generally these waters are uh, driven by phytoplankton. These are typical case one waters. Um, I used uh, measured reflectances in situ uh, to reconstruct the bands of the satellite Modis Aqua. And then I tried to, uh, to compute uh, ratios um, matrix of the ratios, uh, all the combinations for, for the bands, and correlated them with the chlorophyll A. The best correlation is for the blue to green band ratio, the classical one. Uh, this is the standard algorithm to derive chlorophyll correlated with the in-situ chlorophyll concentrations. Uh, it works relatively well. But this is the generally the undersampled area, so I tried to uh, do my own adjustment. I found a little uh, better correlation. Uh, but I would like to focus uh, on the vertical structure. Uh, I compared here two transect exemplary ones, so one with the uh, more unified salinity uh, profile uh, with uh, warmer uh, waters at the surface. But the other one from the northern of, uh, north of Svalbard, uh, where the stratification uh, is uh, more visible in the salinity and temperature, uh, and also in this um, absorption by particles and yellow substances, uh, which I will use uh, further also as a proxy for chlorophyll A, uh, based on the correlation that I uh, showed earlier. Uh, here we can see in the, uh, in the transects uh, the phytoplankton accumulation near surface and uh, on the other transect in the subsurface area around 20 to 30 meters. So uh, is the chlorophyll concentration derived for the uh, reconstructed for the surface really representative for the whole water column? Uh, first of all I uh, tried to identify certain profiles, patterns uh, and see if this is uh, more of regular, um, these deep surface uh, chlorophyll uh, maximums. I did the hierarchical agglomerative clustering, uh, which 
uh, through which I obtained um, four components, four typical uh, vertical profiles um, with the subsurface maximum, the unified in the whole water column, then with the surface maximum and uh, probably echo of uh, the surface uh, high uh, bloom that we reached and observed during the summer. And then I did a rough simulation. Here I assumed uh, ideal correlation between uh, the absorption by particles and yellow substances with the chlorophyll. Uh, and uh, I tested and uh, calculated chlorophyll, summary chlorophyll in the whole water column uh, in relation to the surface concentration uh, constant for all profiles, 0.92 milligrams per cubic meter. Um, I integrated uh, chlorophyll concentrations uh, every meter from the euphotic zone. Uh, there is a difference. Maybe for the variability of the chlorophyll, it's not really striking, but uh, it's only a rough estimation. And when we consider uh, global estimations of biomass, even small differences here in the chlorophyll uh, amount may uh, result in um, different uh, and significant uh, variabilities in the um, global uh, estimations on, of biomass. To sum up, the European Arctic is a highly dynamic, dynamic region and uh, remote sensing has an advantage um, of giving uh, a lot of information from vast areas. They're always in the good spot. Uh, water masses uh, are chlorophyll A dependent. They are driven by phytoplankton. These are classical case one waters, all of them. Uh, which, uh, which we sampled, uh, and the blue-green band ratios works and perform uh, relatively well, um, but uh, the vertical stratification and deep chlorophyll maximums need to be investigated um, to, assess in, uh, to assess the biomass, and it should be considered uh, calculating the primary productivity, especially for globally. Uh, there is a potential to divide and split this, um, this water masses based on the reflectance uh, from the satellites. Uh, however, it needs to be further investigated. Um, and uh, I'll probably uh, have to take a closer look to our data. Um, these are the references. And from this place, I would like to thank uh, all my colleagues that took part uh, in the CEDOM HEAT project, because without them, I wouldn't be here. Um, and thank you all for the attention. Thank you so much once again. We have time for questions. Is there any questions? OK, so I have a question for you. Uh, about the measurement techniques, uh, because you told us that you use the data from two uh, ship, from two ships, uh, were the sampling uh, different, or well, we have um, and the measurement techniques instruments are they comparable or or not? Instruments uh, were used the same on both ships, and the personnel was also. Um, mostly the same, which was the same group with the same methodics. Uh, however, on the, um, on the Lancer, the research vessel Lancer, we um, sampled also more to the Greenland, further to Greenland uh, region. However, I tried to uh, take only um, unified samples and mostly I um, focused on the area that we had uh, and obtained from the uh, Oceania. And I took the profiles even from the RV Lancer that just uh, were in the same area. So I tried to keep everything uh, homogeneous and uh, representative. OK, thank you. Thank you so much once again. I would like to welcome our next speaker. Uh, Marta Venta. Okay, hello. Uh, my name
my name is Marta Venta, and I'm going to talk about the processes above the uh, in the Ar Ar Arctic atmospheric boundary layer over fragmented sea ice. And first, I want to uh, talk about how the numerical weather prediction models treat sea ice. And uh, how does it work? I'm oh, sorry. Can I point? I'm very sorry. Uh, so first, I want to, uh, you to look at this map. It is the map of the ice concentration for 23rd of February 2013. And we can see that the ice, as is it winter? It is winter. Ice is everywhere in the Arctic in this area. I want to focus on this area. Uh, we have a lower concentration here. But uh, when we look at the satellite data from, from the same time, we can see that the ice is cracked into small pieces. And this is the beginning of a very significant event in the Beaufort Sea, when uh, strong winds blowing from the northwest, uh, uh, they shattered the ice uh, into a lot of uh, cracks, and w which we can see on the next slide. And it is only slightly visible on this map. And after three weeks of, the, of, of those winds, we can see that ice looks like this, yes? It is shattered into small pieces. We have a lot of flows, a lot of leads in the ice. And uh, when we look at the map of the ice concentration for that time, we can see that ice is uniform in the Beaufort Sea, yes? It is, the concentration is slightly lower, but the situation is is not as dramatic as here. And what is the point is that our um, models treat sea ice as a plastic surface that stretches and contracts. They do not take under consideration that the ice is divided into uh, flows. And also, uh, I want to point out that this event do not happen like only on in the 20, 2013. It, it happens now quite often in the Arctic. And also, for example, in the narrow strait between Greenland and Greenland and Canada, uh, every w winter there, are, there appears the shattering of uh, the sea ice. And as I, in my study, I focus on the uh, wintertime Arctic, I want to point out some things about the atmosphere in the Arctic in the winter. Uh, the atmosphere is very sta stable because of the temperature inversion. And temperature inversion, what I mean by this, is that the uh, because of the lack of solar radiation, the surface, surface cools very, quick, very quickly. And therefore, the air is very cold uh, above the surface. And uh, atmosphere up is warmer. Um, also because of the advection of the warm air from the mid-latitudes. And as the warm air is lighter, it is above the cold air above the surface. And such, in such stable atmosphere, we do not have mixing or turbulence. And what happens when the crack appears in the sea ice in winter? We can observe here the biggest temperature differences of Earth on Earth of about uh, even 30, 20 degrees. And when we have such a big temperature difference, we have a strong convection. We have an enhanced uh, fluxes of moisture and heat, enhanced turbulence, wind acceleration, and there is also a lead-induced appearance of sea smokes. Sea smoke that consists of uh, water vapor, water droplets, and ice crystals. Although ice crystals are mostly uh, in the upper structure of the convection, so the uh, the atmosphere is no longer stable here. So, as you already know something about the atmosphere in the Arctic, I want to tell you about my model. It is a weather research and forecasting model. And we have an ideal, idealized uh, situation. We have a cubic uh, atmosphere where we have 20,000 meters of width and 2,000 meters of, uh, of altitude. And the resolution is of 100 meters. It is very high for such, such modeling because normally numerical weather prediction models have the resolution of few kilometers. And the sea ice is treated as a fractional field with a concentration ranging from 0 to 100. And the uh, default f thickness is of 1.5 meters. And also we have a lot of parameterizations for counting the, uh, other, other, the 
features of the atmosphere, which uh, I acquired from other studies uh, performed in the Arctic. And also we need the initial conditions. We have the profiles of temperature, vapor mixing ratio, and wind speed. And we acquired them from the Shiba station, which was uh, uh, which took uh, place 20 years ago, and they measured uh, features of the atmosphere in the ocean in the Arctic over the whole year. Uh, we also need uh, the maps of the of the ice, and as I want to focus on the fragmented sea ice, and this is the idealized situation, we have uh, ice divided into flows with two different concentrations of uh, 50 and 90 degrees, and uh, we have a lot of numbers of flows. I, I only present two two examples of the ice maps, and also ice maps with uh, uh, leads or cracks. And uh, on those photos, you can see that uh, they are quite they quite re realistically re represent the situation in the Arctic. So, what happens when we give the model the uniform ice, like here, and the ice uh, with different uh, the distribution of flows? We can observe that the uh, situation is totally different because uh, we have the ambient wind for the same. Uh, point in time, and here the wind is simply has different speeds over sea ice, but blows in one direction, while here we can observe the convection cells, it's uh, so-called open cells in the Arctic, where uh, above the ice we have the downdraft current, and in the convergence zones of the cells we have updraft current and strong convection, it is uh, mostly located above the areas of uh, water. And here we can ob observe the transect from here where the convection is, is visible in the uh, vertical wind component. A bit more about the, I want to start the animation, uh, about the convection. Here we can observe how the cells evaluate in the time, in time, evolve in time. And here is the structure of, of such, of such uh, cell, where above the lead uh, we have low pressure and the updraft of the air. And uh, here, as, the, as I said before, we have water vapor and uh, water droplets which form clouds or sea smoke. And when it reaches the boundary of the Arctic inversion, the air, the air moves side, sideways. And uh, when it meets with another uh, boundary of another cell, it, it goes down and cre creating the structures of open cell. And in open cell, we have on the inside, we do not have clouds because this is the area of uh, divergence. And on the outside, we have uh, clouds surrounding the cell. And we can also observe it on the, for example, on the maps of water, water vapor distribution where those uh, blue uh, areas on this map uh, are the areas of ice. And we can see that the water vapor is mostly located above the water and in the areas of the convergers. While we look at the map of the uniform ice for the same moment and with the same ice co concentration, the situation is totally different. So what is the point? Uh, as we observe in the Arctic, for example, here we have diagrams created by NASA, that the sea ice thickness and sea ice volume is decrease, decreasing. We can uh, expect that strong, strong winds blowing in the Arctic will, sh will shatter the ice not only in the summer, but also in the winter. And as the models treat ice as a plastic structure, and when, for example, uh, uh, we look at the ice and uh, in the model prescribe it, uh, for, for example, concentration of 50%. Uh, the, res the results will be totally different if we gave it the realistic map of the sea ice. So what, are, what is the perspective aim of my study? Is the detailed analysis of, of, analysis of the acquired model results, because we have a lot of them. And I want to focus especially for now on the uh, structure of these convective cells because we can pr probably, we, we hope that we'll be able to compare them with the satellite data. Uh, also, we, we, know we want to add the ocean boundary layer model because from other studies we know that 
the ocean is also very affected by different ice distributions. And in the future, uh, the plan is to couple the, our uh, atmospheric model with the model of the sea ice created by my supervisor, Agnieszka Herman, which uh, you can have a look here. Uh, this model is the model uh, where ice is represented by the assemblage of uh, disc-shaped uh, grains, which are connected by semi-elastic bonds. And uh, those uh, disks are affected by wind uh, blowing in the atmosphere and ocean currents, and also by the grains surrounding them. And we can see that uh, such model uh, re responds well to the compression, stretching, and shear strain caused by the uh, wind or the currents. And uh, such maps are very similar to what we observed on my uh, uh, photos from the satellite data and they quite well represent the realistic situation compared to the treatment of the ice as a plastic surface. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Marta. We have time for questions. Are there any? Okay, so again, I have a question. It could be quite complicated. <laughs> But don't worry. Um, you told only about the model. Do you have any in-situ data to compare it? No, the problem is that the data we used to initialize the model was the data from the Shiba station, which was uh, 20 years ago, because this is the only data from the Arctic that was taken in the winter in the uh, vicinity of the Arctic leads. And the, also, it is not very good because they took the measurements uh, downwind from the lead because it is very dangerous to put the equipment in the ice because this is the very dynamic structure in the uh, border of such ice. And what we would like to have is the data directly from above the crack in the ice. And uh, for now, there's no such data anywhere. And maybe in the future, we have ideas to maybe do this. So I hope so. OK, but if uh, if this uh, so dynamic area, do you think that uh, those initial conditions are representative for maybe now? Yes, from the uh, other studies, we, we think that they are representative, but uh, we have to remember that those processes happening above the fragmented sea ice are not well understood for now. We only have models and algorithms and we have some uh, basic observations, but we do not have the data directly from above the lead. So we, we, we know that they are very like, uh, similar to what really happens in the Arctic, but we cannot validate it uh, like in truth with the realistic data. And we plan to do this in the future. Okay, okay, thank you once again. Okay, and let's move on to the next speaker, uh, Bartłomiej Jerzek. Welcome. Uh, hello, my name is Bartek. Uh, I'm a PhD student at the uh, Institute of Oceanography, uh, University of Gdańsk, and uh, I worked on I work on plankton. Um, and title of my presentation is uh, "Feeding Activity and the Diet of Antarctic Herbivorous Copepods in Response to Change in Phytoplankton Community Composition." And uh, you probably guessed that it's quite quite long uh, title. Um, in shortcut, it should be it should be named. It should sound like are copepods uh, starving? And I will explain, uh, explain this further in the uh, presentation. This is the, um, this is the Antarctic food web, and I am showing this picture uh, just, to, uh, just to place my topic, uh, uh, with, uh, uh, on which I will focus uh, further. In the introduction, uh, I want to I want to focus on the relationship between this, uh, these levels of the, uh, of the um, food chain. 
especially I want to focus on herbivorous zooplankton, namely uh, copepods. But why even uh, care about copepods? Because uh, copepods are a very important uh, component of this whole uh, food web. Uh, they uh, reach very high proportion of the total biomass of the mesozooplankton. Uh, and they, uh, what is uh, very important, they uh, transfer energy produced by the phytoplankton to the higher, uh, higher trophic levels. Uh, this is, uh, let's imagine that this is a, a phytoplankton, a, ba a food base for, uh, for copper pots. These uh, big dots, I would say the big cells are, are diatoms. This, this picture is very simplified, but uh, I, I show it to, uh, for you to, to imagine some, uh, some uh, things. Uh, we can see, that, let's imagine that this is a phytoplankton. Phytoplankton as a food base for uh, copepods, uh, small, small crustaceans that feed on, on, on the phytoplankton. And what is uh, very important about, uh, I, I d divided this phytoplankton for my purpose into two uh, groups. The diatoms that are, uh, that ma that, um, that are main uh, food source for, for copepods and uh, small, tiny, non-diatom taxa, uh, flagellates and crypt cryptophytes that are not uh, select actively selected by the uh, copepods. And there are a few things very important when talking about uh, feeding of copepods. The one thing is uh, that their uh, feeding efficiency is uh, highly dependent on food density and size of its particles. What does it mean? It means that when there is a lot of these tiny, tiny cells, when in the more dense uh, they are, the efficiency of uh, feeding of the copepods is decreasing. We can imagine that there is a lot, lot of dots, lots, a lot of, a lot of cells, and if there is too much of them, the uh, copepods can't feed uh, efficiently. What is more important that uh, from other studies, we, from other studies, we know that copepods, uh, the efficiency of feeding uh, of copepods is very high. Uh, when, when there is a lot of uh, diatoms. So we can assume that uh, it is stated that uh, large diatoms, large, I mean uh, more, than, uh, uh, more than 80 micrometers, are very, uh, are, uh, these, these diatoms um, are the main, main food uh, for, uh, for copepods. The copepods are very eager to eat uh, this one, the, 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 uh, the, the green one green cells. And what's important about uh, the, the, the phytoplankton in the West Antarctic is that, uh, that the uh, contribution of uh, diatoms in the whole uh, abundance of phytoplankton uh, diminished, uh, the, the um, monitoring of phytoplankton revealed a diminished contribution of uh, diatoms in the phytoplankton from, 40, from up to 44% uh, per to uh, 5%. It, uh, it's probably related to the uh, wider shift in the phytoplankton in the West Antarctic uh, coastal zone, uh, probably caused by, uh, caused by uh, meltwater uh, runoff from the glaciers. Uh, let's imagine that the glaciers, glaciers are ma melting and in the surface water, the mm, surface water salinity is, is decreasing and the turbidity is uh, increasing. The salinity is decreasing and the turbidity is uh, increasing and that uh, condition is a very fa fav favorable f favorable for for these tiny cells to proliferate not the diatoms and uh, considering what i said earlier that diatoms are uh, are preferred food for the copepods we can uh, it's it's very important to look into how copepods react to this to this significant shift in the uh, phytoplankton composition now a, a little, little bit about my uh, my study. Uh, my uh, I work on samples uh, gathered in uh, gathered from uh, Admiralty Bay. Admiralty Bay is a uh, is a aquan located in the South Shetland Islands, west of uh, Antarctic Peninsula. It's the biggest uh, bay of the South Shetland, Shetland Islands. It's it's a fjord-like bay, uh, branching uh, to into three smaller inlets. Uh, its uh, maximum depth is uh, five, uh, 500 meters and it's wide open to the Bransfield Strait and the uh, uh, waters from the Bellingshausen Sea. 
and to uh, and the main purpose main goal of my research is to uh, examine and compare the feeding behavior of uh, copepods from uh, different seasons from uh, middle of 90, uh, 19th, uh, year uh, 1994, 1995, to year uh, two, uh, 2003, 2004, and 2008, and 2009. And I planned uh, research tasks uh, that, uh, following research, ta research tasks that includes uh, examine feeding activity of uh, four copepod species. This feeding activity will be estimated as a percentage of specimens of each develop developmental stage with uh, food in gut. Uh, the analysis, th there will be also performed a uh, gut content analysis, I w which include dissecting the, um, the specimen and, uh, and analyzing the gut content uh, under the light microscope and um, scanning electroscope um, microscopy. Um, uh, I will measure the individuals to see if there, there, there are any changes in, in, their, in their condition, in the, uh, in the biomass they, 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 they reach. And as a, uh, as a food base, as a kind of a background, I will uh, analyze the f composition and ab abundance of phytoplankton. And now, in the uh, next slide, I will uh, give a close look for, uh, to the results of the feeding activity of uh, copper pods from the Antarctic summer 2003-2004. Here are our, uh, my uh, point of interest, uh, four, uh, four species of copper pods. Uh, Calanus propinquus, Calanoides acutus, Metrida gerlachei, and uh, Ring canal, uh, Calanus gigas. On this, these bars show the uh, feeding activity. Means that, for example, here the 50% uh, 50 uh, 50 of uh, specimens have food in their gut, mm, and th this is a parameter that helps us to uh, to see how how they how um, how copepods react to the food base they have uh, uh, available in the water. So, talking about uh, Calanus propinquus, th these results aren't uh, very surprising because uh, Calanus propinquus is, um, is considered to be a quite flexible copepod. Uh, e, um, uh, it feeds uh, all, almost all, all over the year and it, uh, it is possible for him to switch from herbivorous to, to omnivorous. It, it, it's called like this in literature. In li literature that uh, this copper pot can, uh, when there is not a lot uh, uh, plant food in in the in the water column, it can switch to the to eating um, to eating even even other copper pots. Uh, Calanoides acutus is a completely different um, species. Um, it it is known to to feed very shortly in the year. Only uh, it it feeds only in the, um, in two months. Uh, in a month and a half in the beginning of spring, and, it's, and this, uh, these results are also not surprising. Uh, we can see that only the, uh, only the females were, uh, were uh, actively feeding, and this feeding activity was, was quite low. And what is surprising, it's uh, the results for Metrida gerlachei. Metrida gerlachei. Uh, this this copepod is known to be uh, very flexible, and uh, it, uh, like, uh, Calano, it is known to be mo even more actively feeding than Calanus propinquus. It feeds all, all, almost all over the year. And uh, this, this one, th because these three species are known to be mm, pre prevailing herbivorous, but this, this one is uh, known to be omnivorous. That it's not only the uh, phytoplankton, but even the tiny, tiny zooplankton. And this, this uh, very low uh, feeding activity is very, very, very surprising. It's very, very. It, it's a surprise to to see so so so, so low uh, feeding activity. And um, for Rinclanus gigas, the feeding activity was uh, was zero. There, I, I didn't found any any Rinclanus gigas with with food in gut. And it's uh, it's important to notice that. Mm, that I haven't seen uh, that mm, that Rinclanus gigas occurred in in a very low number uh, generally. Mm, 
And what, 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 what's the other thing very important to, to, to say is that uh, when I worked at the samples gathered uh, from the Admiralty Bay, uh, there were, there were uh, very few copper pots. Uh, in the year, uh, years uh, earlier, there were a lot of, lot of copper pots in numbers, but when I uh, looked into the, the, those samples, there were, there were very, very few copper pots in general in the, in the samples from uh, Admiralty Bay. Uh, so, sum, summing up, what is important to uh, lock in your mind, that uh, shifts from diatoms to tiny flagell flagellates is very important, uh, is a potenti potentially of great importance for uh, plankton filter feeders, and what's the, uh, what gives us that uh, the kind of a, a take-home message that uh, this uh, significant change in life cycles of herbivorous copepods uh, may be very unfavorable uh, for higher trophic levels, because uh, as I said, they transfer transfer the energy accumulated in the first level to the uh, higher trophic, trophic levels. And here are some references, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very, thank you very much for your uh, interesting presentation. You. Are there any questions? One. Uh, at some point, you've mentioned turbidity as a favorable uh, condition for, for growing. Can you explain a bit of the mechanism behind that? Mm. Uh, it, is, it is stated that diatoms need, uh, mm, diatoms need, uh, the diatoms need a, we can say, a clear water, not, not the turbid water to, to proliferate. And it is stated that in Antarctic waters, the higher uh, in, in, the region, in the regions when there is a high turbidity, uh, there are more d dinoflagellates. The dinoflagellates and the cryptophytes strongly, uh, strongly dominant, do, 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 mm, is, mm, are, mm, are likely to dominate the, the phytoplankton composition. It's, uh, it's also, uh, also linked with the other uh, mm, physical factors like, like wind, like, uh, like the density, like, like the uh, salinity, as I said. But it, it is stated that uh, when there is a lot of turbidity in the water, the, it is more likely to uh, uh, cryptophytes to uh, mm, to dominate the phytoplankton. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I have more of a comment. Uh, if you have a choice between the title that you presented and I don't even remember, and the one, or a couple of starving, don't hesitate. Use the other one. Yes, I know. It's I far know. more Thank catchy. You. And everybody likes horror stories, you know. Yeah. So. <laughs> Are there uh, and then question uh, more? Uh, we have time for one more question. Okay. So, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. And I would like to invite uh, next speaker is uh, Katarzyna Walczyńska. Hello everyone, my name is Katarzyna Walczyńska. I'm a PhD student in University of Gdańsk, but also University Center in Svalbard. Uh, I would like to acknowledge my uh, co-authors of this presentation, Mati Manko and Agata Weidman. Uh, so today uh, I will tell you a little bit about melting glaciers as an in a conspicuous threat to uh, polar zoo plankton. Uh, on the beginning, for those not uh, that much familiar with the topic, I would like to remind that zooplankton are animals which live in a water column and uh, can move uh, against water currents, which is kind of substantial for my topic here. Um, Arctic zooplankton is a really diverse group as uh, it's uh, composed of uh, typical oceanic Arctic species, more, uh, more shelf also Arctic species, and some uh, of the moderate, uh, more um, brackish uh, character. Um, I'm talking, uh, I will talk about the glaciers, so a um, few words of introduction here. Uh, in general, I made my, I conducted my research in Archipelago of Svalbard, which is situated in high Arctic, 
and uh, this is uh, area of Svalbard, but uh, more or less 60% uh, of the area are covered with glacier, uh, of which a big part are uh, tidewater uh, glaciers. Uh, earlier, uh, on the beginning, uh, Timo, Timon was talking about global warming, so actually it's really important when we are talking about Arctic, as here this process is going way faster than in other parts of the world, in general in polar regions. And uh, uh, some data shows that uh, declining in the glaciers is from like uh, to 5 to 15 uh, cubic kilometers per year. And uh, here on this uh, picture, this bluish part, is, is it shows a glacier just directly after the calving. So this is how it uh, looks like. But uh, going directly to my subject, what glaciers have to do with zooplankton? Uh, as uh, I mentioned, uh, this uh, more oceanic parts are usually uh, in the outer parts of the fjord. And uh, there is uh, estuarine circulation in the glacier fjords, which moves uh, these um, animals uh, towards, uh, towards the glaciers. And uh, this is area where they can uh, meet the meltwater from the glaciers. And uh, as a result, this is a fresh water. Uh, there is a phenomenon called osmotic shock, because they can't cope with the low salinity. Uh, and, uh, and uh, in general, uh, big uh, sedimentation, uh, water is really turbid. So there is a mass mortality of these organisms. And the uh, goal, uh, goal of my research was to actually check how the uh, salinity influences uh, zooplankton, because we, uh, we often say that uh, all these Arctic species are really stenohyaline, but we don't exactly know what what it means, what is the range of their tolerance. So we, uh, we performed some experiments and animals for these experiments were uh, collected in Free Fjord, in Kongsfjorden and Korsfjorden, and uh, Riefjorden by a uh, MIGNET from the research vessel Hermann Hansen. Uh, and uh, we've made uh, salinity and respiration experiment on several Arctic uh, species. Uh, some Calanus species, uh, Tisanoesta species, Temisto abessorum, Eclione limacina, Mertensia ovum, and Limacina helicina. And uh, here uh, you can see when the experiments were performed, uh, which species we used. Uh, I would like also to say that prior all experiments, all animals were acclimatized, uh, and then we put them in this uh, salinities. This is the amount of animals we use in each experiment. Uh, but uh, respiration, uh, respiration experiment, we only made for two salinities, 34.5 and 26, to see how, what is uh, metabolism reaction for the, for the lower uh, salinity. And going to uh, results, what's, uh, what's interesting here, uh, for all, actually all uh, species we use, uh, because we measured the mortality, I didn't mention, sorry. Uh, we measured mortality rate, which was a proportion of dying population per hour. And uh, in uh, uh, salinities between 35 and 24, this uh, mortality rate was lower than 0 0.01, which, is, which means that they actually cope uh, quite well with the uh, salinity changes. Then it was... Uh, like an intensive uh, increase in mortality rates, and actually below 15 PSU, all organisms were dying. Um, another uh, thing uh, we did, uh, I said that um, animals were collected in uh, different fjords, and this uh, fjord, which, is mo which was more like northernmost, it's um, generally more colder, so uh, technically, uh, animals in both yours could have different adaptations. So what we check, we check if there were uh, differences uh, between fjords in the small mortality rate. But I only showed these few examples here because for most of them, it was not uh, statistically significant, only for actually for uh, these two. And going to respiration experiment for uh, most of the species, um, 
the um, respiration rate was higher in, in the lower salinity, which actually makes sense. But again, it was not statistically uh, significant, uh, except for uh, Limacina uh, helicina. And uh, uh, we had a really good opportunity during the cruise. We could use um, Yetiak, which is a remote operated uh, small boat. We attached CTD to it, so we could uh, measure uh, salinity direct directly below the glacier because uh, we wanted to check if actually this process, uh, this phenomenon, osmotic shock actually um, is there, if it happens there. But from all our measurements, uh, the lowest salinity we found, it was 27 PSU. So it seems like uh, actually in this particular moment, uh, it didn't happen and it was still salinity well when uh, our animals can, uh, can cope with. But uh, this changes in salinity in melting of the glacier uh, are changing seasonally, but also there are si some differences uh, between years. And um, th this might um, happen in uh, different ways, as you can see it. It's not always looking uh, the same. We just didn't observe it. Uh, and what's uh, going uh, out from, from our results uh, is that this all uh, stenohyaline line called uh, species are actually have a bigger tolerance than, than we thought. But all this... Uh, all these things, all this process has uh, bigger consequences because it's not only important for uh, zooplankton, uh, but um, only for uh, for other trophic levels. levels. Uh, for for example, for uh, birds, and um, it's uh, it was already well observed and uh, shown many times. And uh, this is probably a publication you you might be familiar with. Uh, this is how it looks like uh, when it happens because it creates a hot spot for many organisms. Uh, there, are, there, is a, there are a lot of birds, there might be also uh, marine mammals uh, because uh, also amount of fishes increase, but this dead zooplankton is also a food for benthic scavengers. So it has like a really a big impact for the whole environment. Uh, and uh, to answer where, uh, where the world is heading, uh, all these processes, global warming, it's still it's getting more intense. Uh, so this process might just get, get bigger. And it's actually really hard to say what's, what's going to happen. We just try to investigate it, uh, try to know this process uh, better. But... Um, I hope that uh, zooplankton will be able to adjust to this uh, condition. It's probably just my wish, but I hope. Uh, and in the end, I would like to uh, acknowledge Paul Renault and Gerald Dernis, because uh, this uh, research was made during the uh, marine zooplankton course, and they were watching over the, uh, the also the sampling, but also the data uh, preparation. And uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, for the presentation. Uh, are there any uh, questions from the uh, audience? Okay. Hi. Um, one of the slides uh, showed something called boiling water. Um, could you clarify? What, what is that? Was that in regard to temperature or the amount of organisms uh, active there? It was uh, towards the end. There are four black and white pictures. Ah, okay. I, I get yes. It. That. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's just what you said. Uh, there is this uh, very big uh, concentration uh, of, uh, uh, of these dead animals. Uh, so there's a lot of birds. So it's actually, as you could see on a movie, it's li it can be literally, literally boiling there. <coughs> are there any uh, more questions? Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, it's time for the last presentation in this session and welcome Ivona Vrubal from our institute. The floor is yours. Well, 
Welcome, everybody. My name is Ivana Vrubel, and I'm a PhD student at the Institute of Oceanology, Polish Academy of Science. Uh, the title of my presentation is Can We Use Our Brain to Study Climate Change? By this presentation, I want to ask where the question where the world is heading. Um, so, please, um, let's start. How the brain can help us to get a knowledge about, about the climate change? Our brain is a unique organ and it has the amazing ability to control our whole body. Uh, in one millisecond, uh, the brain do an incredible number of tasks and one of the tasks is accept a flood of inf information from the outside by touching, hearing, smell and taste. Uh, and this, uh, Tasks. Uh, I tell you about this task because, because this is one which interested uh, interested me. Uh, and as we know, our brain is made up of a, of about billion of neurons. Uh, the neurons are connected to each other and they communicate uh, via the electrochemical signals. Uh, the neurons um, are made a network. Um, one neuron is built from the dendrites, synapses, and the axon. Uh, the role of the neurons are to, uh, is to accept the information from the outside, um, send the information from uh, through their body to the other uh, neuron, to the other, to the other. Thanks to what the, we can react at the uh, and answer the at the information which we get from the from the outside. When the information from the outside get to the, the um, neuron uh, from the cell body, the information is sent via uh, through the axon to the end of the axon. And when it reached the end of the uh, axon, it um, released the electrochemical neurotransmitter. And by the synapse, it, the information, the signal is sent to the uh, other neurons. The uh, target neurons accept the information from the, the signals from the outside, and also it releases uh, his own information and send this uh, to the next ne neuron, to the next, to the next, to the next, uh, and so on and so on. This is important because uh, a long time ago, some computer scientists take a look at the, at the neuron, uh, neurons network uh, and they start to think that, okay, so if we can do the recognition task, if we can accept, uh, if our brain can accept the information from the outside, let's the computer uh, do this. So this is, uh, oh, okay, so one uh, small repeat. Um, how the, how the whole information is going on. Um, but the computer scientist um, create something which is called artificial neural networks. Artificial neural networks is the computer model using the learning machine. Um, we can use this to, um, we use this model to teach the computer uh, how it's supposed to transfer the information. Um, and we, we can use the neural network for the classification, cluster, controlling, forecasting, etc., etc. Which uh, the information which is important for me, uh, why I want to use the neural network is uh, to control, it, which means determining value for the input variables to achieve desired values for output variables. Okay, so the idea was that uh, Based on the uh, brain works, we let's create the nodes and the connection between nodes um, to transfer some information. On this graph, you can see a mishmash of nodes and connection. But can we take some information from this graph? Of course not. So what we have to do, we have to call an uh, input node uh, and in turn that n uh, and the connection b from this node and to in turn the nodes to choose the other nodes which is which it is connected to but even after that we cannot also take any information from this graph so what we have to do next is we have to organize all these uh, networks um, and this is how the neural networks uh, are created so we uh, organized all nodes then uh, we have some input nodes, output nodes. We also want, uh, would like to have uh, well-defined 
uh, direct of connection be uh, between uh, nodes, uh, things that we know in which way the information is going to. Uh, we would also like to have um, different strength of the connection between two nodes. Uh, thanks to what we know that some nodes are more important for the, the other nodes uh, than, than the others. Um, what is important that we can, uh, we always said at the, when we start the model, we always said random weights. <laughs> it's important to remember that. Uh, at the, uh, the, the input uh, layer, we've got the value. At the output layer, we also got the value. We get the value. But in, in the middle, we've got the, the nodes where we set a, a function. Um, we can influence on the, this layer, and we need to, uh, in this type of uh, artificial neural network, you need to have a, a basic knowledge about the, the output. Um, but we cannot influence on what is going on in the middle of uh, these two layers. Uh, we can only set uh, um, an, what we call activation function to uh, calculate the correlation between the input and the output. We can, uh, of course, put a lot of uh, input nodes to the input layer, but we have to remember that uh, the computer is not working as, uh, as quickly as our brain. So um, we have to, to remember about that and um, take as, uh, as much input nodes as, uh, as we need. Mm. As I said, that we cannot uh, influence on the um, calculation which are uh, b happen happening between these two uh, layers. So uh, in the middle, we call this hide hidden layer. We cannot see this in, in our calculation, our model. We, we see only the, um, uh, the output uh, value. Um, as I said, we teach the computer model uh, what we already know. So we have to have some basic knowledge about the input uh, value, about the output value, and uh, uh, the co about the correlation between uh, between them. Uh, we don't we don't need some um, advances uh, advances uh, information about the uh, physics of the process. For this, we use the the. Um, artificial neural network model. Mm, so let's go to, to some example. Okay, in this example we've got, in the, at the input layer, uh, wind speed, temperature, salinity, ice cover. At the output layer, we've got RC fluxes, and we know that in some way, this uh, input's value influence on the fluxes uh, in, the, in my, um, for me, in the in the Arctic, uh, we know that the, the inputs influence that the, the fluxes are stronger negative or stronger positive. But we don't know exactly how and which more influence on the on this um, output. So what we have to do, we have to set a random weights uh, between the connection of the. Uh, of the nodes from the inside and the nodes in the hidden layer. Uh, we also have to set uh, an activation layer, which means we choose an uh, activation function, I'm sorry, which means we choose a function, uh, things what we can um, calculate the correlation between this. Um, so we said we've got this, we've, uh, we have a basic knowledge about the desired output, we set random weights, we choose the um, activation function, let's choose the sigmoidal function. Uh, so we start our model. The model uh, calculated the activation uh, rate, which uh, let's take a look at the H3 uh, nodes. So the model calculated the activation rates by multiplying the value from the temperature, uh, multiplied by the strength of the connection between the temperature and the H3, uh, plus the v multiply the value in salinity by the uh, strength of connection between the salinity and the um, H3 uh, nodes. Uh, and we know, uh, as we can see, uh, this connection is more important for H3 the, by, uh, than this. So this, uh, the temperature uh, influence more uh, greater for H3 than the salinity. We, uh, our output in after that is the activation rate, uh, rates, and when the activation rates uh, is greater than our tr uh, threshold, 
it sends the information to the next layer and to the next layer and to the next layer. But this is very simple, so it, and it's not satisfied me. So what we have to do, we have to set, as I said uh, say earlier, the activation function. Let's take a sigmoidal. Uh, so, okay, we put the, the activation function. We've got some uh, mathematical constant. We've got the activation uh, rate and uh, number of uh, choosing um, the, the process. Um, and when the activation function uh, is greater than the threshold, in this uh, case is the positive, the signal is sending to the uh, next layer as the output, and uh, when it's sending to the next uh, nodes, it's became an input for this node, and so on, and so on, and so on. What we see, what we get, because we, not can, we can't see this, what we get is the output. And um, our, the output value. And we see, hmm, okay. But it's not all. What uh, the more important question in this uh, sta at this stage is how the neural networks learn and also how of the connection wedge is the term. For this one, we have to use the prop uh, back propagation uh, process. How the back propagation process works? So, as I said earlier, we set our um, inputs uh, value. We have some knowledge about the outputs value, the desired outputs. We set random weights. Uh, we set the uh, we, we set an activation function. We start uh, our uh, model. The model is processing, processing, processing. Okay, and we see that our calculate output from the model uh, is different than uh, our. Um, desired output, which we already uh, know. So what we have to do, we have to um, calculate the difference between uh, the calculate output and the desired output. And the difference between this we call errors. Next, we uh, the output, um, all model is going uh, on uh, back. So the error is sending to the nodes in the hidden layer uh, it's cross with the it's crossing with the uh, connection weights because what we want to do is we want to correct the weight of the correction because we uh, we said this at, uh, at first to be random so the in this one it's calculated the um, or the new random uh, the new connection for this is sending to the nodes calculate the collection uh, the connection weight for this uh and we are at uh, the first stage, uh, stage. So the model is starting one more time, but w uh, in at this time with the new strange of connection wave. So the model is uh, processing one more time. It's get to the uh, to the end, and we see that there is still some errors. So the processing is going on, going on, going on till the error is not uh, z zero or is still uh, descending. Here is the small summary up uh, how the uh, artificial neural network with the uh, back propagation processes uh, works and looks like. Uh, okay, so we assign random weights. We're using the inputs and the connection way to find the activation rate of hidden nodes, using the activation rates of hidden nodes and link Cages to put to outputs, find the activation rate of output nodes, find the error rate at the output node, and to do back propagation. Uh, using the weights and error found an output node, cascade down error to the hidden nodes, recalibrate the weights between the hidden node and the input nodes, and repeat the, the process till the error is the standing. Mm. There is uh, some conclusion. Um, the main conclusion from um, uh, my, uh, my presentation is that. Man learned the machine, the machine replaced the, the man. So the answer for the question where the world is heading, is heading to, to the technical. So that's the question. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ivana. Uh, we have plenty of time for questions. Are there any? Okay. So. <laughs> Um, I think it's, uh, the, it's not the main purpose of your studies, so my question is uh, how can you use the results from your presentation or 
maybe how it's connected to your purpose of your scientific study? Yes, it's not um, the purpose of my uh, PhD, it's the purpose of my uh, pr p preludium founding from the Na National Center uh, uh, of P Polish. Uh, so how I can use, um, I'm not using exactly this because there is a lot of type of artificial neural network. Which one, uh, the one which I want to use, it's the self-organizing uh, which I um, uh, will use, it's self-organizing maps. I, uh, ha I've got the knowledge about the um, the value uh, from the temperature salinity by ice cover biological in the Arctic, and I know uh, that the, the fluxes between the air and the sea is changing in the Arctic. But I want to see which of this uh, that the um, particle pressure of uh, carbon dioxide or the temperature or the biological uh, activity or the ice cover influence more on the on the fluxes. Uh, I want to um, check the whole process and I also want to in the future interpolate that uh, okay in the future maybe temperature change about the two uh, degree and uh, how it can influence on the, uh, the result how will be the result of the of the fluxes at the end this, um. okay thank you once again oh sorry one more question okay but why why the neural network? Uh, because our uh, basic interpolation is not uh, good for, for me. I've, uh, I start to read the, uh, some uh, scientific paper and uh, from the people from the Germany or from the United States, and they start to use this. They've, they've got a good results, and I want, to, but um, well, some of them use this in, in the Arctic. And this is uh, because I am also using in situ data. So it's not, I'm, on, uh, uh, I'm not only using the, um, I didn't say that, but I'm using the in situ in my uh, study in situ data and also the uh, data from the satellite. So o Okay, but can you, can you, by using the neural network, can you use greater uh, packages of information to, to, to analyze or faster? Wh why the neural network? Why not the... The, the model that you're using on the daily basis. I, I, I miss the, I mean, uh, is it just, the, just your fantasy to, yeah. to do it? I mean, <laughs> fine with me, but yes. but is there some sort of like realistic reason for that? Yes, yes, it uh, gives us the uh, better results than the uh, basic interpolation. Also, we can put there uh, more information in, in one, uh, uh, as the you, you can process more more yes. data through yes, the neural yes, network. Yes, yes, okay. yes. And we can do this uh, more quicker than, if we know the whole process, the, the whole way of the process, we can do this in uh, quicker than just a simple population. Okay, any more questions? Um, yeah, d does it require uh, a lot of computing power? Do you, can you run this neural network on your laptop or, or yeah. do you need a server room full of not, not right now. Right now, uh, there is in the MATLAB or statistical program, uh, especially uh, package that when I can cr create the, this model. So, so anybody can run it. Yes. Yes. Okay. Of course. Cool. One more. Uh, hello. And uh, in which area are you focused? You've mentioned Arctic, but what is the the area you are focused on? European Arctic. Yes. The. This one? European Arctic. Yes, yes. Whole European Arctic. Uh, yes. Yes. The okay. So, thank you. Okay, I think it's, uh, it's uh, enough question. Thank you, Ivona. And it was our last presentation in this session. So, it's now time for a coffee break. And we see here again at 11. Thank you.